Today we're going to look at a topic that I really enjoy, complex numbers. Uh, it's important to have a little bit of a background on complex numbers. We're, we're just going to just, you know, touch on what they are and a little bit of how to work with them because we are going into some specific functions like quadratic functions where we're going to be dealing with solutions that involve imaginary numbers. So this section will set you up as far as understanding imaginary numbers enough to go on and solve equations and work with functions that have imaginary zeros or imaginary solutions, those kinds of things. Okay, so starting with uh, like what a complex number is or what an imaginary number is. You know, so far we've, in this course, we've only worked with real numbers. Um, real numbers you know, like your integers, your whole numbers, your fractions, your decimals. Uh, or even your irrational numbers like pi. But now we're going to add these imaginary numbers so that we will have the full complex number system with which to work. Okay, so what does an imaginary number look like? Well, that's in the next uh, slide. It talks about what imaginary numbers look like. They are complex numbers of the form, I mean, complex numbers of the form um, a plus bi You've got a is the real part, b is the imaginary part, and i is the imaginary number listed below. So you've got i equals square root of negative 1, or i squared equals negative 1. Okay, what is i? Well, i is the answer to a long-standing problem in mathematics where mathematicians would work with problems and suddenly have to deal with the square root of a negative. And at the time, you know, they were only working with real numbers, so they had no idea what to do with these problems. And they would, you know, put them aside and say, well, we can't do these, you know, nothing much we can do from here. So they go and work on something else. But these problems are stacking up, and some of them, it was really need necessary to start solving some of them somehow to understand things going on in the real world. And along comes Euler. He says, you know what, let's just, let's let i stand for the square root of negative 1. Let's let i squared be negative 1 and let's work with that. And suddenly this whole area of mathematics was open to be worked on. And the remarkable thing about i is that you square, it's, it itself is imaginary, but you square it and you get something that's real. So i squared is negative one. <clears throat> so now if you have a square root with a negative inside, you can work with it and simplify and get, you know, square root of a negative number equals i square roots of something. So now you're able to work with it. So what this has done is open us up to, again, the imaginary number system, or the complex number system, being able to go through and say, okay, uh, now I can not just do the reals, but now I can do all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> so, you know, to start out with when you're, when you're a kid, you, you first had started out with uh, learning how to count with the natural or counting numbers. So you learn, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. I was thinking about the count from Sesame Street. But <clears throat> you first learned with those. And, you know, those are the numbers you naturally learn to count with. You don't start with zero or negatives. But then as you get a little older, you start thinking about the concept of zero because you realize, you know, if, if, some, if you have four blocks and somebody comes and takes all of them from you, now you have zero blocks. So then you've got to handle on the whole numbers. Whole numbers are the natural numbers plus zero. And then you get a little older than that and you start getting allowance. You start dealing with money. So not only can you have one, two, three, four, five dollars, etc., or even zero dollars, but now you probably start thinking about, well, I really want that toy over there. Maybe I can borrow some money to get it. And then you start thinking about negatives. When you do, you've got your integers. So the integers are your whole numbers plus their opposites. And then around that same time, too, in school, they start teaching you about fractions. So then you start dealing with rational numbers. 
overall, all these are rational numbers. You start to learn about the rest of the rational numbers. So that's the integers plus the fractions or decimals. And then if you're like my son and have two math teachers for parents, you've probably already started learning about irrational numbers before you even really started learning about fractions in school. <clears throat> rational numbers are numbers that can be made into ratios or fractions. You know, ratio, fraction. Uh, so a number like 2 is rational because you can write it as 2 over 1. 3 fourths is rational. You know, 8 over 7 is rational. Irrational numbers would be numbers like pi, e, square root of 2, numbers like that where you can't express them as fractions. And if you were to try to write them as a decimal, the decimal goes on and on and on forever, never stops and never starts over. But these are all part of your real numbers. But today, I'm going to have you branch out and not just work with real numbers, but also work with non-real numbers. Non-real. And as you work with non-real numbers, you're going to be working with square root of negative 1. <clears throat> and all of these make up the complex number system. So you've been working with the complex number system all this time, but you probably didn't know that's what it was called, unless you've already seen this before in previous high school classes or something. But all, all these numbers can be expressed as complex numbers in the form a plus bi. And that's, and that's where you are now. You've rounded out your complex numbers because now you're dealing with imaginary numbers. So now you're able to deal with non-real numbers that include i in them include the imaginary number, you know, the I in there. Okay, so imaginary number I, it's going to be situated next to B, which is the complex the imaginary part of this complex number. A is the real part, B is the imaginary part, and then I is that imaginary number. Um, if you're dealing with a complex number like 3 plus 5I, 3 is the real part, five is the imaginary part, and of course you've got the i next to the five. Um, if you're dealing with a number like two, keep in mind that two is the same thing as two plus zero i, so the real part is two. Imaginary part is zero. If you're dealing with a number like negative 6i, the real part is zero. You could write this as zero minus 6i. And the imaginary part is negative 6. So all of these can fit into your complex numbers. And your real and imaginary parts can be fractions, decimals, integers, so they can be anything. Okay. <clears throat> the one I just showed you here with negative 6i, that is a pure imaginary number. While the one over here, 3 plus 5i, we'll just call it non-real complex number. So. So the 2 is just a real number. T plus 0i. The negative 6i was a pure imaginary number. And the 3 plus 5i, they, just, they call it non-real complex. Okay, so now you know your categories. <clears throat>
let's go ahead and work with simplifying some roots that have that i involved. Square roots with negative radicands. Let's go ahead and do some of those. Uh, we can simplify square roots with negative radicands by bringing out the i first and then simplifying the square root once the radicand is positive. Um, it's really necessary though, if, if the radicand is negative, bring out the i first. I, I usually say take out the i. Sounds kind of violent, but, but that's what you're doing. You're taking out the i and then, and then simplifying the square root that remains. Okay, for example, let's say you have square root of negative 36. Well, we know square root of 36 is 6, but this is square root of negative 36. So keeping in mind that negative 36 is the same thing as saying negative 1 times 36. What you've really got here is square root of negative 1 times square root of 36. Well, square root of negative 1 is i. Square root of 36 is 6. So you end up with 6i. Usually we'll write, if it's just a number and not a radical, we'll write the number first and the i second. Kind of like writing 6x instead of x6. If you have something like square root of negative 44, again, take out the i first. If you see this negative, essentially what's going to happen is you're going to end up with an i out front and square root of 44. Well, square root of 44, we can factor 44 into 4 times 11. Square root of 4 is 2, and then you're still left with square root of 11. If, the, if there's a number without a radical, we put it to the left of the i. But if there's a number with, with a radical, we put that to the right of the i. So we write it like this. So i will go to the left of any square roots. Oops, excuse me. So i will go to the left of any square roots. And we do that to help avoid confusion because like if you wrote, if you have i square roots of 11 and if you wrote it square root of 11 i and you're like a sloppy writer or write fast or something, it might be hard for people to tell whether the i is supposed to be inside the radical or outside because you know, i could appear inside a radicand. Uh, so you want to just go ahead and if it's supposed to be outside the radical sign, write it in the front. So this helps people to be clear on what's going on. <clears throat> okay, so there's there's that. That's how you deal with simplifying square root of a negative. Now, if you have to do some operations with negative radicands involved. Like, like, like say example products or multiplication, quotients, division, make sure you take the i's out first because your product rule for radicals and your quotient rule for radicals only applies to positive radicands, positive numbers underneath the radical sign. So you must take out your i's first in order to be able to apply those product and quotient rules. For example, let's say you have something like square root of negative 3, and you want to multiply it with square root of negative 13. You can't multiply these yet because square root of negative 3 has a negative radicand, and square root of negative 13 also has a negative radicand. So you have to bring out your i's first. If you don't bring out your i's first, you could get it wrong. Now you might be lucky and might end up with the right answer, but not always. Okay, so then, you know, we've got i times, remember this i next to the square root is like saying i times, and this i next to the square root is like saying i times. So commutative property, we could go ahead and multiply i and i together. And then we could also multiply square root of 3 and square root of 13 together. Well, i times i is i squared. And then we can, then we can apply the product rule to our radicals and go ahead and do 3 times 13 under one radical sign. Well, i squared we learned is negative 1, and that's times square root of 39. So we end up with negative square root of 39. That was our answer. And that's actually not what we would have gotten if we had tried to go and apply the product rule up here without taking out the i's first. 
If we had gone right away and tried to apply the product rule, we would have gotten square root of positive 39. And that's not the answer. The answer is negative square root of positive 39. So take out your eyes first. Sometimes you get lucky and it works out, but not always. So just be aware. Next problem, you might get lucky and it might work out if you do it the wrong way. But don't take that chance. Uh, square root of 7 times square root of negative 21. All right, take out your eye first. So then you'll have i times the square root of 7 times 21, which is 147. But 147 will factor into 49 times 3. And square root of 49 is 7. So in our final answer, we'll have 7i square root of 3. And you probably would end up with this answer anyways if you had well, just gone and jumped into multiplying and then taken out your i later. But it won't always work. And that would have been still an incorrect method. Multiplication division too, like if you have square root of negative 35 over square root of negative 5, go ahead and take out your i's first before you apply your quotient rule for, for radical, radicals. Let's see here. In this case, you take out your i's first, i over i will reduce down to 1, and then you're left with square root of 35 over square root of 5 which you can then put under one radical sign. 35 divided by 5 is 7. So you end up with square root of 7. And that's what you probably would have ended up with if you had you know, tackled it without following the correct procedure. But it's not always. And then um, let's say we have square root of negative 14 over square root of 2. Take out your i first, then you can apply your product rule, and you end up with i square roots of 7 in this one. Okay, so there's something to think about with products and quotients that involve negative radicals. Now, with the, back to the complex number form, the a plus bi form. You're going to be asked to do some operations with those complex numbers. Adding, subtracting, multiplying, simplifying. They say dividing, but I really don't like saying dividing because you're not really dividing. But you'll see what I mean when we get there. Okay, adding and subtracting complex numbers. Add or subtract the real parts to get a new real part. Add or subtract the imaginary parts to get a new imaginary part. And then put your results in the A plus BI format. Basically, what this comes down to is combine like terms. If you remember combining like terms in previous algebra lessons, that's basically what you're doing here. Your real parts are like terms, and your imaginary parts are like terms. You combine them. Okay, so let's say you have something like negative 6 plus 7i, and you want to add that with 13 minus 4i. Okay, this is plus in the middle here. So I don't really need to worry about distributing anything because I don't have anything in front of these parentheses. So this is negative 6 plus 7i. And this plus or plus 1 distributed would give me plus 13 and minus 4i. So then I can take the real parts, the negative 6 and the plus 13, put those together to get 7. And I can take the imaginary parts, 7i minus 4i, Put those together and get plus 3i. So, and then your final answer is in that a plus bi format. So that, that's how you handle addition. And then subtraction. Same kind of concept. except you've got to make sure to distribute your minus sign. 
that's where people get caught up. They don't shoot the minus sign correctly. Uh, first part, 15 plus 6i, I can just remove the parentheses because I don't see anything in front of the parentheses, so it's just 15 plus 6i. But this minus sign here, I have to make sure I distribute it to each of the terms in the parentheses. People will usually get the minus 21 part right, but for some whatever reason, they don't want to distribute the minus to the minus 13i. And you have to. You have to distribute to each term in the parentheses. So minus minus becomes plus 13i. So then the real parts, you got the 15 and the minus 21, gives you negative 6. Imaginary parts, you've got plus 6i plus 13i, and that'll give you plus 19i. There you go. So that's how it's done with addition and subtraction. Multiplication, it's just like multiplying polynomials. <clears throat> Distribute, use FOIL, whatever is needed, depending on how many terms you have. And then make sure you simplify by combining like terms. And the final answer should be in the A plus BI format. For example, let's say you have 3 minus 9i, and you want to multiply that with 12 plus 6i. Notice that there's nothing in between the parentheses here. No plus or minus signs, so that tells me I'm multiplying, not adding or subtracting. If there's a plus or minus sign in between, then I know I'm adding or subtracting. For some reason, on addition problems, people try to multiply, even though there's a plus sign in between the parentheses. Multiplying if there's no gap here. OK, so I've got two terms times two terms, binomial times binomial. Essentially, that's foiling. So I'm, I'm taking the 3, distributing it to the 12. It gives me 36. Then I'm taking the 3, distributing it to the plus 6i gives me plus 18i. It's like multiplying 3 times 6x, you, you would get 18x. Same kind of concept. Then I'm taking the minus 9i, distributing that to the 12. That'll give me negative 108i. And then taking my minus 9i, subtracting, or distributing it to the 6i, gives me minus 54i squared. All right, the plus 18i and the minus 108i, I'm going to get negative 90i when I combine those two. For now, I'm just going to rewrite 36. And then over here, keep in mind that i squared is equal to negative 1. So I've got negative 54 times negative 1, which becomes plus 54. And then I can combine the 36 and the 54 and get 90, I got 90 minus 90i. I just made up this problem, did not intend for it to work out this way. You're not always going to get A and B the same. In this case, you did. Sorry. <laughs> but we'll do another one. <clears throat> okay, so well, that's that. Um, let's say you have 10 plus 2i, and you want to square it. So you're going to do 10 plus 2i times 10 plus 2i. Well, you square binomial, you should end up with a perfect square trinomial. What you do here, technically, I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, let's see, distribute your 10. 10 times 10 is 100. 10 times plus 2i is plus 20i. Then distribute your 2i. 2i times 10 gives you plus 20i. And distribute 2i times 2i gives you plus 4i squared. Well, you technically do have a perfect square trinomial here. Uh, 10 squared is 100. 10 times 2i is 20i double. It's going to give you plus 40i here in the middle. And 2i times 2i, or 2i squared, is 4i squared. Now, so you do end up technically with the perfect square trinomial. But this one, we can simplify some more. Because this i squared plus 4i squared, same thing as minus 4. 100 minus 4 is 96. So I end up with 96 plus 
49. And this is an example too where A and B are not always the same. You no, know, it happened kind of over here, but it's not always going to work out that way. There you go with how to multiply complex numbers that have that imaginary part in them. And finally, we're going to get to that last part. They call it dividing. I really don't like calling it dividing. It's really simplifying. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about simplifying powers by. If you have an i to the first, same thing as i, i squared is negative 1. We know those two because of definition. If you wanted to do i cubed, you break it down to i squared times i. Well, we know i squared is negative 1 times i is negative i. If we want to do i to the fourth, we can break it down, i cubed times i. We now know i cubed is negative i times i is going to give us negative i squared. So negative negative 1 or 1. i to the fifth, we can break it down to i to the fourth times i. We know i to the fourth is 1 times i is i. i to the sixth, we can break it down to i to the fourth times i squared. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. I to the seventh is I to the fourth times I cubed, one times negative I, negative I. I to the eighth is I to the fourth times I to the fourth, or one times one, which is one. From here on out, you can break down your powers of I to some to I to the fourth power in some way, or one, times I to another power, I to the zero, one, two, or three. And we now know what i to the we know i to the zero is going to be one. I to the first is i. I squared is negative one. I cubed is negative i. So all of our answers are going to break down somehow to one or i or negative one or negative i. And it's a pattern. If you kept going, you're going to see a pattern. You're going to see it alternate from i's to ones. So i one, i one, i one, i one. But then some of them are negatives. Notice we got positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, negative, negative, positive. So the pattern, the way it goes is I won, I won, with two negatives in the middle. So, so that's the pattern from starting with I to the first, going to I to the fourth, I won, I won, with two negatives in the middle. And then I to the fifth to I to the eighth, I won, I won, with two negatives in the middle. So, so you know, knowing that, we can break down any power of I we want to break down. You know, then here's just repeating what I was just saying. I want, I want, two negatives in the middle. So you just break it down to powers of four first and then see what's left over. For example, let's say you got to find i to the 22nd power. Figure out what that simplifies to. Well, i to the 22nd, I'm thinking about multiples of four. The closest multiple of four to 22 is 20. So I can rewrite this as i to the 20th times i squared. Well, i to the 20th is a multiple of 4. 20 is a multiple of 4. I can rewrite this as i to the 4th raised to the 5th power. And the reason I want to do that is because I know that i to the 4th is really 1. And 1 to a power is just going to give me another 1. So 1 times i squared is i squared. And you know, think about your i1, i1 with two negatives in the middle. i squared is negative 1. So i to the 22nd is, comes, breaks down to the same thing that i squared does, negative 1. If you have something bigger and you're like, oh my gosh, how can I figure out multiples of 4? Let's say you have something like i to the 733rd. I just made up that number. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. And you want to figure out, you know, what to break this down to, right? So that you have somehow i to the fourth to some power times i to some other power. Okay? You want to figure out how to break that down. So let me erase my little question marks here because we're going to fill that in. Okay, so what we can do is take 733 and divide by 4. 
Okay, we get 183 remainder 1. Uh, 4 times 183 should be 732. So we can break this down to i to the 732 times i to the 1st. Well, i to the 732 can be broken down to i to the 4th raised to the 183rd power. If you, raise four, if you take 4 times 183, you should get 732. And then you got the leftover, the remainder, gives you this exponent here. So you get i to the 1st. Well, you know, i to the 4th is 1. And whether you have 1 to the 8th power or 1 to the 183rd power, it doesn't really matter. It's still 1. So you have 1 times i, which is i. So really, what you're really worried about focusing on is this leftover right here. Because that is going to be the true indicator of your simplified result. Because over here, however many times 4 went into your exponent, that's, that's really not going to matter in the end because you're going to have 1 raised to that power. And that's just going to come out to 1. But this remainder right here, that is what goes here, i to that power. And that, whatever that simplifies to, is going to be multiplied by 1. So that, whatever that simplifies to, is going to be your result. So let's do one more. Let's say we have i to the 230, 233rd power. I'll just divide 233 by 4. You know what? I don't like that one. I, wanna, I was trying to find one with a different exponent just so you can see something a little different. So let's change that from 233 to... Thirty-five. Hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody. Sorry. Okay, three. Bring down the five. Four times eight is thirty-two, and we get a remainder of three. So that remainder of three, that's what we need to focus on. So we get i cubed. Uh, remember i one, i one with two negatives in the middle. I cubed ends up being negative i. So that's our simplified form. So we end up with 1 times i cubed anyways. Uh, or, so we end up with 1 times negative i or negative i. So that's just something to think about when you're trying to simplify powers of i. All right, and this process of simplifying powers of i will be helpful when you are dividing complex numbers. And I put air quotes around dividing. You can't see me do it, but I did. <clears throat> Because dividing complex numbers is really a matter of simplifying fractions so that you don't have a complex number on the bottom. And in order to do that, we need to know what a conjugate is. Complex conjugate. Find the con sign of, to find the conjugate of a complex number, change the sign of the imaginary part. If you have a plus bi, change it to a minus bi. If you have a minus bi, change it to a plus bi. Whatever the imaginary part is, change the sign in front of it. Because when you multiply a complex number and its conjugate, to, conjugate together, you no longer have an i in there. And that is essential for simplifying the fractions. You're not allowed to have imaginary numbers in denominators of fractions. Kind of like when you did radicals and you weren't allowed to leave roots in the denominators of fractions. So you got to try to find an equivalent fraction. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the conjugate of the denominator, multiply top and bottom by it. Top might still have an i. Bottom, though, will not, because like we, like we noticed in the previous slide, if you multiply a complex number and its conjugate together, there's no i to be found anywhere. And if you don't believe me, just foil this out, multiply it out, and show that you actually end up with a squared plus b squared. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's say you have something like... 3 plus i over 5 minus i. Okay, this is not simplified because you see an i down here in the denominator. So what you're going to do, is you're going to take the complex conjugate of 5 minus i, which is 5 plus i, you're going to put it over itself. 
This is perfectly legal. You can multiply by this because 5 plus i over 5 plus i is really 1. Multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. Value. So we're not changing the value. We're just changing the way it looks. You know, it's like plastic surgery. You're not changing who the person is on the inside. You're just changing the way they look. So we are going to multiply top together, bottoms together, and we should end up with a nice fraction that does not have an i in the denominator. So we got to do 3 plus i times 5 plus i up here. And we're going to do 5 minus i times 5 plus i down here. Okay, in the numerator, distribute. 3 times 5 is 15. Then I've got plus 3i. Then I've got plus 5i. And then I've got plus i squared. Denominator, I got 25. Here's where you'll see how this works out. Plus 5i minus 5i minus i squared. Well, remember, i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So in the numerator, I've got 15 minus 1, or 14, plus 3i plus 5i is 8i. Denominator, plus 5i minus 5i goes to 0. And then 25 minus negative 1 becomes 25 plus 1, or 26. So I do end up with a squared minus, <clears throat> I do end up with a squared minus b squared. You know, because the outer and inner in here are opposites and go to 0. So a is 5, 5 squared is 25, minus b is i squared, b is i, i squared. But then I gotta go a little further because I know that i squared is negative 1. So I have minus a negative 1 or a plus 1, and that's how I end up with that 26. Now one more thing. do want to reduce this fraction so you're not quite done. You did simplify so that you no longer have an i in the denominator. Woohoo! Yay! Pat yourself on the back. But this could still be reduced a little bit. If you look at 14 and 8 and 26, they all have a GCF of 2. As the numerator, I could factor out a 2, and then the 2 over 26 would reduce to 1 over 13. So there's that. So that's your final, final answer. That's how it would look in the very end. <clears throat> Okay, let's say, let's do another one. I'll say you have something like 8 over i. Well, i in the denominator, remember, complex conjugate changes the sign in front of your i. So your complex conjugate in this case would be negative i. So you end up with negative 8i over negative i squared. So you end up with negative 8i over 1 or negative 8i. So there's your final answer there. <clears throat> then one other point to make, just so you're aware, earlier we had gotten 7 plus 4i over 13 for an answer. Just be aware that this can be written also in a broken up form, where you can put the 7 over 13 plus 4 over 13i. Just be aware that that's another way that the answer could be written. So the same answer as the top problem there, just another way it could be expressed, so, just so you're aware. All right, so there you go. That's what you need to know for complex numbers. 3.1 will have you practicing that stuff, and then 3.2 will be diving into quadratic functions where we're going to end up dealing with imaginary numbers, both with with functions and then later when we're solving the equations. So, hope you enjoyed and tune in next time for our quadratics. <laughs>